and how terrible they are, and oh, how did women breathe, how did we live, how did we function, I do not know, it is a mystery hidden through the depths of history, and we'll never be able to uncover these mysteries, because somehow women were able to survive hundreds of years with these boned torture contraptions around their bodies. <laughs> Gorgeous scenery, exquisite music, and the sexiest awkward hand flex of all time. <laughs> Jill Wright's Pride and Prejudice from 2005 has, in so many ways, surpassed BBC's 1995 Pride and Prejudice in popularity, costume swooning, and meme ability. Okay, so full disclosure, when I set out to make this video, I was originally intending on doing the comparison of the costumes from the 1995 version to the 2005 version of Pride and Prejudice. Tonight on Costumer Mania's Battle of the PPs! I totally did just say PP on YouTube because I'm an adult. But I realized very quickly that it wouldn't really be a fair discussion. After doing a bit of looking into 2005 Pride and Prejudice, it became clear that a good deal of research was done on the period and an artistic approach was taken with the costuming instead of a true historical approach, which deserves respect as well discussion in its own right. While on the other hand, the 1995 version of Pride and Prejudice literally looks like they raided the V&A for original garments and accessories. By the way, about that, they totally used originals for the accessories, and you can tell by the quality of lace and the caps and the kerchiefs that they wear. So, um, rest in peace, caps. Nice knowing you. Honestly, I wasn't a fan of this version of Pride and Prejudice when it first came out. I was right in that stage of the Dunning-Kruger effect that left me overconfident and leaving the movie theater thinking that the movie was flaming hot garbage. And how dare they design such a terrible movie. <laughs> 15 years later, I was wrong. The costume is not flaming hot garbage. While it's not perfect, nothing ever is perfect, after many, many, many rewatchings, I've realized that it's actually thoughtfully done. And today we're going to talk about what they got right and what they got wrong with the women's costumes. I am not talking about the men's clothing because y'all, that is not my area of expertise. However, I can just say with my very limited knowledge of tailoring that it's meh. But it doesn't really matter because we're all too way damn distracted by Darcy's hand flex and dejected wet puppy proposal and uh, Rupert Friend as Mr. Wickham because oh <laughs> god, he's so pretty. <sighs> also, side note, can we just talk about how Matthew McFadden went from this to this in just five years? Wow. <laughs> Before we begin going through character by character, I want to make a couple of just general observations about the general overall look and stylistic choices of the movie. The first thing I want to say is that I really appreciated how the movie used color for character and mood. I really hate it when designers use shades of brown, grayish, and sadness for historical films. Yeah, I'm talking about you, Duchess. People loved color in the past, honestly, more than we do today. And I always give loads of credit to designers who play with color in historical film. Secondly, my biggest critique of this film that I just kind of need to get off my chest is that I hated. I hated the hair, guys. The hair was smoking hot garbage and I hated 90% of it. I wanted to find things I liked about it, but honestly, I couldn't. Don't even get me started on what was going on with Lydia and Kitty's hair. That is like some prime bicentennial. I just, I really hated it. It's bad. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm done. Now moving on to much better, better things. Unlike the 1995 version, which is set in the 18 teens when Pride and Prejudice is published, Joe Wright set his version earlier in keeping with the first version of PMP that was written. So somewhere around 1797 to 1800. He's quoted as saying, I find empire line dresses are very ugly. And so I did some research. Although the novel was published in 1813, Jane Austen wrote her first draft of Pride and Prejudice, then called First Impressions, around 1797. So we used the fashions of the earlier period where the waist on the dresses was lower and more flattering. 
Okay. So with that in mind, we're going to be looking at the costumes for the women in this movie through the lens of the turn of the century, 1797 to about 1802. And while I can totally relate to the shapes of the 18 teens not being everyone's cuppa, this whole lower waistline thing is a bit funky because in the last half of the 1790s, we actually have very high waistlines. The skirt shapes and fullness are different, but for the most part, the waist is directly under the bust. I would even argue that sometimes the lines were higher in the 90s than they were in the teens. Just saying. However, I agree with Joe about the 1790s versus 18 teens. I freaking love the 1790s and I encourage everyone to give it a go. It's a wild decade for fashion. Lord only knows why. Angry young aristocrats would roam the streets looking for revolutionaries to beat to death. <laughs> This doesn't mean that they were wrong about the lower waistline, it just means that they must have found a few of the very random lower waisted fashion plates from this period and used those as their main inspiration. That's right, if you weren't aware, there was this random like flash trend of dropping the waistline somewhere between your underboob and your waist, let's call it your ri middle rib cage, at random points around 1799 and 1800. It wasn't a dominant trend going through gallery of fashion and other fashion plate books. You see more higher waisted gowns but this lower waistline is sprinkled throughout the pages for those years. Some originals and museums also appear to have this slightly lowered waistline, but sometimes it's hard to really judge that because it could also just be that the gown was meant for someone with a fuller bust than the mannequin. I think trying to work with this awkward waistline was an interesting decision and reflecting back on it right now, I can actually see how this kind of helps tell the story of age and fashion when you compare Mrs. Bennett to Lizzie to Caroline Bingley, for example. I'm no longer surprised at your knowing only six accomplished women. I rather want to know at your knowing any. Are you so severe on your own sex? I never saw such a woman. According to the Pride and Prejudice companion book, the designs for Lizzie were founded in a more tomboyish, natural bookworm approach with a heavy leaning on natural colors and earth tones. Overall, the costumes are actually pretty okay, honestly, and there's nothing terribly exciting or overly offensive about them. I do, however, want to take a moment to talk about a few of my favorites, though. First up is my most favorite gown in this whole movie. I'm not even exaggerating. This is my favorite gown. The blue and gray striped number that she wears at Netherfield Park when Jane is sick. Now I know. This sounds weird, but hear me out. I totally get that on some surface level, you might think this gown is ugly and weird. However, this gown is actually awesome because of the way it was cut and styled, which is that of a gown that was remade from an earlier style. When you really sit there and stare at it, trust me, I've stared at it a lot. The hallmarks of a remade gown are there and I think it's just amazing. We have the center front closing with this front being on a gentle bias, which was a thing for the 1780s gowns. The back of the gown has back pleats that are just kind of cut off in this really awkward area, which is a great hallmark of a remake. Also just kind of how the skirt hangs, the neckline, all of it. These kinds of details are seen in original gowns that were refashioned from older styles and I just, I cannot get over this kind of detail. I, I just, I freaking love it. It's my favorite. I just love how it looks. I love the detail of this design and how it really helps add to the story. Was this a remake of Mrs. Bennett's old dress? Was it a remake of a dress that Lizzie wore pre-1795 when she was a bit younger? I don't know and I don't care. All I know is that I love it and I think it's great. Next up is everyone's favorite, that brown dress. What we could call a jumper dress is also a favorite, even though it's not perfect. Sleeveless dresses with white shirts or chemisettes were totally a thing during the 1790s, and I love how hers has this cool, casual, very relatable feel. The buttons on the neckline have a more modern appearance to them, and they don't really fit with what you see in original imagery, but I do love the concept. Also, this gown appears to be made out of wool, which I'm partial to because I think for Lizzie's character, wools make a lot more sense than the gauzy, homespunny, weird cotton dresses that she wears throughout most of the film. I really liked the texture of it. As for the shirt she wears, I thought they did a nice job with it. The details of the collar and the shoulder reinforcement, the size of the sleeves, all of this gives a lovely artistic and natural feel to Lizzie, which I think does very well for the 1790s. These chemisettes or shirts with the more masculine collar were also a trend in the 90s, and I think having her in the style does help separate her out from her sisters and does a great job conveying her character within the bounds of 1790s fashion trends. 
My other favorite gown that she wears is when she visits Pemberley. I really enjoyed the stripes and the shape of it, including that bias bit at the bottom. That helped make it feel a little bit more fashion forward, while the embroidery in the back was a little bit odd. I was able to find some similar soutache designs in Spencer's, so I'm assuming that they kind of drew inspiration from those motifs. My one complaint with this dress is that it felt very flat in the skirts, and I realized when she was standing in front of a window with the sun coming through it, you can see through the layers of her clothes, and there doesn't seem to be an under petticoat on. I actually found this surprising since they do show Lizzie and Jane wearing under petticoats while getting ready for the Netherfield ball, but she doesn't seem to have one on here, and frankly, that's a shame because that would have really helped get the silhouette to looking a bit better than what it does because I do feel like her skirts are very limp and flat throughout most of the film, which honestly is my biggest complaint with her costuming. And while I understand that clingy muslin skirts were a trend, and you can see that in fashion plates, it's one of those things where the success of this look depends on the textile. And for the late 1790s, there was a lot of fabric in the skirts, especially if the fabric was thin. Even when you get into the 1800s and 18 teens with the flat fronts of the gowns, there is still a lot of fabric in the back of the skirts to help really create an elegant shape and give some ease of movement. This limp skirt issue is why I'm not as big of a fan of her other dresses in the movie, like the brown and the green round gowns that she wears for a lot of the film. While the green and brown round gowns were fine and classic 1790s in their cuts and designs, the skirts just felt a bit limp and I wasn't terribly fond of the fabric choice. They looked too thin and flimsy, almost as if they were going to just shatter and fall apart. If we're working within this natural feel of a character in the countryside, I would have liked to have seen a more practical fabric used. Lightweight worsted wools or a heavier weight linen. This is a really minor critique. I just kept looking at these fabrics and thinking how poorly woven and limp they were looking. It didn't feel fully within the realm of Lizzie to wear such an impractical fabric that also wouldn't have lasted a long time. This is in contrast to her blue stripe and brown wool gowns, which were very much in keeping with Lizzie's character choices. When you look at more average, everyday clothes that survive in museums, there is a hardiness to them, a substantialness to them. They have this weight and quality to them that feels very wholesome and like just there and sturdy and yeah. And I feel like I'm describing beef stew now. So there's that. For example, these gowns in the Colonial Williamsburg collection are great examples of normal everyday clothes that are beautiful as well as practical. Also given Lizzie's propensity for going on walks outside for hours at a time with little regard to the mud, I would hope that she'd wear a better fabric for this pastime unless her goal was to actually make the laundress who takes care of her clothes really freaking hate her. Like, a lot. Overall, I liked the design choices for Lizzie, how they integrated her character into the clothing. It created a really nice contrast to the 1995 Lizzie, who actually looked like she just literally fell out of an Ackerman's repository. Mr. Darcy and Mr. Bingley, ma'am. All right, I have to be honest. If I had to pick a better dressed sister, it's gonna be Jane. I like her costumes better. But I also fully embrace that I, my love of pink and blue are far outweigh my love of the color brown because I am not an earth tone girl. I'm a winter. Okay. According to the director and designer Jacqueline Duran, Jane is supposed to be the most fashion forward in the family. And the way that I see that translated is that they stuck to a more fashionable and normal higher waist with her gowns. The costumes are a bit spread out date wise from her blue pelisse that has a very strong 18 teens feel to her open robe and round gowns that are great examples of the 1790s. I particularly enjoy the fullness and shape of her Netherfield ball gown. It's simple, it's full and a great example of the 1790s. Also like 10 points to the stitchers who did the hand stitching on the necklines of her gowns because you can see that in the film and it's just chef's kiss. I see you, I acknowledge you, and I appreciate you. Thank you for all that you do. I also wanna give a special shout out to the morning gown that she wears when she goes down to breakfast and is just kinda of around the house sometimes. I I love it so much. It's just, oh, it's so good. It's so good, it's so good guys, like it's just, To be fair, it is a bit more 18 teens in its cut and styling, but I just love how the actress Rosamund Pike wears it, just loosely, semi-tied, falling open, just whatever. Like these little adjustments help bring these pieces forward as clothing and not just as costumes, which I think can often be lost in translation when we look at stagnant museum exhibition or portraits. The realness and diversity of how people wore their clothing can be lost by that. And seeing these kinds of little details just make me extremely 
extremely happy. You know, these were people's clothes, right? Like it wasn't just one way to wear a garment. It wasn't just you had to wear your kerchief tucked into your neckline or not tucked into your neckline. <laughs> There's nuances and personal preference and personal comfort. And so to see her play with that within these costumes and really make them appear to be clothes and behave like clothing is just, mm, it's so good. I just, oh, it's so good to see that kind of comfort in the actress with her clothing and with her costumes. It just really helps with the believability of everything. Miss Elizabeth Bennett. Next up is Caroline. This is gonna be really short and sweet and to the point. I don't really have that much to say about Caroline. Basically like, yeah, she looked great. You know, she obviously was dressed closer to the 18 teens with that smooth front of her gowns and a more fashionable under the bust look. I do love how they put her in the sleeveless number for the ball to make her like really fashion forward. And then the red silk gown that she wears when spending time with Lizzie at Netherfield Park, like it's lovely, it's great. That's it, like cool. So we may not visit if you do not, as you well know, Mr. Bennett. Listening, you never listen. You must, Papa, at once. All right, so this next one's actually pretty hard for me because we need to talk about Mrs. Bennett. And Mrs. Bennett's costumes are both fantastic and problematic. And our reflection of my overall just general complaint with the design decisions for this movie. And just kind of historical films in general and just kind of weird ideas that people have about the past. And it is this. Just because you're a woman of a certain age does not mean that you are dressed in the fashions of your youth. Can we please just put this to rest? The evidence that survives shows actually just the opposite of this weird idea. And look, while I understand that they did this as a way to show age and not poverty, because literally every woman over the age of 40 is dressed in styles 1770 and earlier, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, more money than God. It bugs the crap out of me because women over 40 still love fashion and women over 40 still want to be fashionable and that there were styles and fashions and accessories worn by older women that would signify their age but still keep them in the same, oh, I don't know, decade. I just really hate this idea that people who are older in the past just magically stopped caring about their clothes and, and looking fashionable and being on trend and, and being considered just like a normal participant in society that over you, like the moment you become a certain age, all of a sudden you just stop caring. It's not like we see people today dress exactly like they're wearing, like they're not wearing the same types of clothes from the 70s that they wore in their youth. Like my mom is over a certain age and she doesn't dress like she did in the 70s. Like she dresses like a woman over a certain age in 2020 dresses. Like she doesn't, it's just weird. And why wasn't Mr. Bennett dressed then like a sofa? Like he was dressed like everybody else basically. I mean, maybe he had a more conservative older style cut of jacket. He didn't look like that. Like why do the women look this way? Allow women just over the age of 40 to participate in fashion in the past. Allow them to actually give a shit about on pure waist gowns. Allow them to be interested in fashion changes. Don't force them to wear what they wore when they would have been 20. Like that just doesn't make any sense. It's, and frankly, it's lazy. It's cool to explore what older people would have worn during different fashion periods. Like what would have woman over the age of 40 who was a mother, what would she have worn to make her look different from her daughters? You know, like that's interesting stuff that's fun to explore. I think leaning on this, like they dressed in the fashions of their youth. Look, clothing was remade over and over and over and over again. And 1770s and 80s gowns were easily remade into 1790s and 1800s style gowns. Labor was very inexpensive compared to the cost of the material. And so having gowns and clothing remade uh, to be updated was extremely common for both women and men. It would have only cost a few shillings to have a gown remade and updated to the more fashionable silhouette. Mrs. Bennett is gauche, a gossip, money-focused, way too indulgent of her ridiculous younger daughters, and shows a lack of Georgian manners and propriety. So it would actually make sense for Mrs. B to try and dress up too trendy, to 
make a spectacle of herself in public as if she is trying to pretend she's as young as her daughters instead of just dressing 20 years out of fashion. That concept of making a spectacle of oneself in dress and older women trying to dress younger than they are were both common satirical themes during the 18th and 19th centuries. And so I honestly think that they missed out on a really good opportunity here to help tell the story and show character via the costumes by relying on a really tired movie trope. It's a bummer, to be honest. Now, with all that being said, I do want to stress that the gowns that Mrs. Bennett wears are gorgeous. The cut and fit of them are lovely and she looks banging in her stays. So while I don't agree with the design decisions, I do love the fit of the gowns and I love how they look on her. Brenda Blethlin, the actress who played Mrs. Bennett, wears all of her costumes so, so well. Like Rosamond, the way she moved in the pieces, the way they were styled, they did actually look like clothes and not just rigid, awkward costumes. There was a softness and a worn out quality to them that I identified with and I found to be particularly beautiful. Also, I want to give a special shout out to that quilted waistcoat she wears in the bedroom scene after Lydia runs off with the delicious Mr. Wickham. What a freaking fantastic detail that shows off how much research Jacqueline Duran actually did for this movie. Seriously, that detail alone was Oscar worthy. Though I do take issue with people thinking that these things were worn over stays while also being worn at home in undress because that actually makes no sense whatsoever. And just to be clear, this is not a critique of the designer. She was just working with the information she had available at the time. I'm just saying that I don't agree with the information that has been put out there on the subject because it doesn't make any sense. However, that is a different subject for a different video and a different rabbit hole for a different day. And yes, one day I will probably go into it. Cause I can't help myself. So will you come to the ball tomorrow, Papa? I believe so. <laughs> I don't have too much to say about Lydia and Kitty. While their costumes were fine and lovely, since they weren't really the main characters, I never really felt like I got enough time with the costumes to become super familiar with them and develop any sort of strong opinion other than like, yeah, okay. Cool, that tracks. I guess the biggest thing about Kitty and Lydia that I did like was how they seemed to have like raided their mother's wardrobe and they took out all these cute little jackets and short gowns like from the late 1780s and early 90s and they wore them in this like lovely like a dishabille sort of way. And the cut and style of the gowns do kind of play nicely with that they're teenagers and not really children but they're not really full adults either sort of way and I also really liked the colors that they used for that. I will also feel like a total asshole if I leave out Mary who while drab actually had really lovely gowns that were styled a little bit more fashion forward a little bit more like 1800s, 1805, 1810. So I see you, Mary. Well done, you. Mm. I want to talk about one more thing. The corsets and stays that were actually worn in this movie. So good. You don't see much in the ways of unders being worn in this movie. But when you do get to see them, I was actually quite giddy to see two very awesome details. First, first, the stays are spiral laced, guys. Do you hear that, everyone else in Hollywood? Spiral laced. Look, we don't ask for much in this nerdy little subculture of ours, and spiral lacing is just one of those things that just brings our nerdy little hearts so much damn glee. It is ridiculous. I may or may not have actually texted people about the spiral lacing in the States, and I am not ashamed at all. Additionally, in the ball prep scene between Jane and Lizzie, you can see that the stays that they're wearing, how they're actually a little shorter waisted and in that kind of transitional phase from the traditional like 18th century conical shape to the 19th century like locked and loaded style. The only critique I have, and it's not really that even fair of a critique, it's just a thing that I noticed, is that they obviously seem to have been more heavily boned than actually what the originals were and what the silhouette calls for. So if they had just actually boned them less, there would have been more a bust curve and thrustiness, which is better for the 1790s because they were all about boobies back then. However, I think it's a natural assumption to want to put more boning in these garments because in the early aughts, that's what would have actually made sense with the research available at that time. There's no judgment there. It's just like, you know, you know this actually could have been a little bit better here, but it's still fantastic. So about like this whole like stays in corsetry thing, and we know how actresses just love to talk about corsets and how uncomfortable they are, 
and how terrible they are, and oh, how did women breathe? How did we live? How did we function? I do not know. It is a mystery hidden through the depths of history, and we'll never be able to uncover these mysteries because somehow women were able to survive hundreds of years with these boned torture contraptions around their bodies. And actresses today, who are definitely not the vainest of creatures, completely focused on what their bodies look like because they're told to always lose weight because the camera adds 10 pounds, as does quarantine. How do they function in them corsets? We will never know. But actually, um, and Kira Knightley did an interview where she talked about the, obviously the corsets um, in this in this video, and she actually talked about how comfortable they were and how she enjoyed wearing them and how they were super pleasant to wear because you know they were shorter, so they weren't over her stomach where you know you can't breathe because apparently actresses also use their intestines to breathe. Anatomy confusion aside, she did talk about how comfortable the corsetry was for this movie, and I found that to be like very pleasant and just like, thank you, Kira. Thank you for standing up there, even though pirates. I can't breathe. Yes, I, I'm a bit nervous myself. And that, everyone, is basically my analysis of the 2005 Pride and Prejudice, their costumes, the design decisions, what I liked and what I didn't like. And like I said, overall, I actually found the costumes to be quite lovely, great for character development, and you can see a lot of research and care was taken in the conceptualization of these costumes as well as their construction. So Jacqueline Duran, well done you, like seriously, well done. And I apologize on behalf of my like 20 year old self or like 19, 19, 19 year old self who was a little too sassy to her friends on AOL Instant Messenger about your costumes. Like, I apologize. This is dust. And with that, my fellow nerdlings, I hope that you have enjoyed this video on the costumes of the 2005 Pride and Prejudice. If you haven't seen this version of Pride and Prejudice, I actually highly recommend it, just for the cinematography alone, because it's literally one of the most beautiful movies I have ever seen. It's stunning. <laughs> and the soundtrack is just so good. And the hand flex. Ugh. Anyways, with that, my lovelies, I hope that you all have a marvelous week, and I will see you all back here next week with another video. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you all next time. Bye! That's the wrong song. Mrs. Barrett, my nerves! Jacqueline Duran, Jacqueline Duran, that's our lady, her name is Jacqueline Duran. Oh, Jacqueline, what's up, Grizzy? How you doing? Ears clean and her butt fur trimmed up because it was a disaster. This shit, guys, let's do it. Pride and Prejudice, a discussion. Mm, we're good. Oh, my baby. Oh, the baby. Netherfield Park was let at last. Doo -doo -doo. Do do do.